Good evening those new to my channel and returning Macabros, and welcome to the second installment in my One Fatal Flaw series. This series aims to discuss films that I argue suffer tremendously from a single writing and or directorial decision. That is not to say that this is the only flaw in the entire film, nor do I mean to say said flaw makes the film a complete and utter crapshoot, but rather the particular flaw significantly reduces the quality of the film and or prevents it from being far more effective and or thematically brilliant than it already may be. Today we will discuss Ryan Johnson's 2013 sci-fi film, Looper. The film tells the story of Joe, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who is a looper a mob employee who specializes in eliminating targets that are sent into the past from the future, in order to dispose of any incriminating evidence. When the mob decides to retire a looper, they send back the looper's future self to be killed by their past self, which is known as closing a loop. Joe's future self, played by Bruce Willis, is sent into the past to be killed, but young Joe is incapacitated by him. The rest of the film chronicles young Joe's attempt to hunt down his future self and kill him so as not to face the wrath of his employers. One thing I wholeheartedly admire about Looper is that, from a screenwriting perspective, the first half of the film is absolutely pitch perfect. The film begins with an intriguing and attention-grabbing opening, quickly and efficiently sets up the world of the story, establishes our flawed protagonist, and sets up a crystal clear central conflict going into the first act. The second act begins by once again efficiently establishing our main antagonist in an insanely good montage, builds up the rising action, and culminates in a fantastic one-on-one -on -one scene between young and old Joe, establishing old Joe's motivations and goals. And then we get to the second half of the film and well we'll come back to that. Now before we get to what I consider to be the film's fatal flaw, let's get something obvious out of the way. The rules that the film sets up for itself in terms of how time travel works don't really make all that much sense or at the very least are extremely unclear. For example, the scene where we see Paul Dana's character's future self losing body parts as his past self is being cut up by the mob well, this doesn't really make all that much sense, since Paul Dano's character most likely is killed by the mob, so how does he go on to get sent back to the past? Maybe we are dealing with a multiverse situation? In addition to this, the entire concept of the mob sending people back to be killed doesn't really make all that much sense, since yes, the people have trackers in them that prevents the future people from killing them, which is why they have to be sent back to be killed, but wouldn't the authorities notice once all these people start going missing from certain particular spots where the time travel machines are located? Usually I wouldn't dwell on this sort of stuff too much, but since the actual rules of how past events affect the future are vital to the resolution of the story, it isn't something that I can just hand wave. However, that is not the flaw I have decided to explore, seeing as one, the flimsiness of the time travel mechanics isn't going to be that big of a deal for a lot of viewers. I mean, they matter to me, and I feel the inconsistency of how it all works drastically hurts the film, but for a lot of viewers, they probably wouldn't dwell on it all that much. And two, having the rules of time travel make complete airtight logical sense wasn't all that big of a concern for writer director Ryan Johnson as is evident in the diner scene where Bruce Willis does a sort of meta fourth wall break, if you will, telling his younger self to cut it out with all the time travel theory crap. I don't want to talk about time travel shit. Because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be here all day talking about it, making diagrams with straws. He simply wanted to use time travel to set up the story and then let the characters take over from there, not harping on too much about all the sci-fi mumbo jumbo. With this film especially, because even though it is a time travel movie, the pleasure of it doesn't come from the mess of time travel. It's not a film like Primer, a 2004 cult movie that deals in the complexities of time travel, for instance, where the big part of the enjoyment is kind of working out all the intricacies of it. For Looper, I very much wanted it to be a more character-based movie that is more about how these characters dealt with the situation time travel has brought about. So the biggest challenge was figuring out how to not spend the whole movie explaining the rules and figure out how to put it out there in a way that made sense on some intuitive level for the audience, then get past it and deal with the real meat of the story. So in contrast to say a film such as Primer, as he mentioned, which for those who don't know, is a notoriously complicated time travel film, also one of my all-time favorites, rather than worrying about how all the time travel and multiple timelines and whatnot make sense, Ryan wanted to simply use time travel to set up the conflict of the story and then have the sci-fi stuff take a back seat to the character dynamics. Again, I would argue since the resolution of the story depends so heavily on the rules that the film sets up, this idea is rendered pretty moot. But again, for many viewers, 
this isn't a big deal, and most of them probably were more interested in the characters and the conflict itself. However, Ryan makes a big mistake in saying this, since the second half of the film does the exact thing he said he didn't want to do. Which brings us to our fatal flaw of the film, which is... Early in the film, Young Joe mentions that in addition to time travel being something that exists in the future, a certain percentage of the population has a TK mutation, giving them a minor form of telekinesis. This comes into play later in the story when it is revealed that in the future, a powerful man known as the Rainmaker, who is implied to be a powerful telekinetic, is taking over the crime empire of the future and closing all the looper loops. Old Joe plans to kill the Rainmaker as a boy to prevent the death of his wife decades in the future. After Young and Old Joe face off, Young Joe follows a map that Old Joe had to a farm where he meets Sarah and her son Sid. It is later revealed that Sid has TK and his abilities are far more powerful than anyone else's we have seen thus far in the film. After Sid kills a mob enforcer who comes for Young Joe, Young Joe realizes that Sid is in fact the Rainmaker. So let's talk about the introduction of TK and the negative effects it has on the film. The first wrench that TK throws into the film is that it sort of comes out of nowhere in the second half of the film. Yes, they do mention TK early in the film, but as to why Sid's TK is so OP, an explanation is never given. Not only that, but what caused TK to become a thing? Is it related in some way to what resulted in time travel being discovered? The point I am making is that the film asks us to suspend our disbelief in terms of buying into the whole concept of time travel, but then later it also asks us to suspend our belief again when it comes to TK. What is rather ironic about this is that it sort of goes against what Ryan said about using time travel as merely a means to an end in order to tell his story. He used time travel to set up the story and we have the characters take over, but come the second half of the film, all of a sudden TK is introduced in a big game-changing way, which results in a good portion of the remaining runtime being dedicated to setting up Sid's powers and Young Joe's realization that he is in fact the Rainmaker. This is one of my personal biggest pet peeves when it comes to sci-fi, where writers will often introduce additional sci-fi elements late in the game for narrative purposes, which in turn results in the suspension of disbelief of the audience being pushed a bit too far and the additional sci-fi element or elements taking over the story. I would argue that sci-fi works best when a single element is introduced in the beginning of the film and everything that happens after that is an extrapolation of the consequences of that element being introduced. The man himself, Marty McFly, puts it best. The answers can be really tricky, but the question has to be simple. The question has to be said, well, what happens if you can go back in time? What happens if you ran into your parents? What happens if you could shrink a submarine and put it in the human body and have it do surgical repairs? In, say, Back to the Future, the film uses time travel to set up the scenario of Marty going back 30 years and running into his parents as teenagers. But the moment Marty arrives in 1955, the film sort of reels back on the whole sci-fi angle until the very end when it's time to go back. The Terminator sets up a killer android coming from the future to kill Sarah Connor, and the rest of the film is an extrapolation from that simple setup. In Alien, there is a big-ass alien running wild on a spaceship, picking off the crew, and yours truly, one by one, and the film runs with it. One element is introduced, and the rest of the film is an extrapolation of said element. Ironically, the film Primer, despite its borderline absurd complexity, follows this same principle. The film tells the story of friends Abe and Aaron who discover a method of time travel. Eventually, their careless experimentation results in multiple versions of themselves all messing with and sabotaging each other. As I said, the film is notoriously difficult to understand, especially in its final act. However, this is sort of the point. The entire plot of the film revolves around Abe and Aaron being so careless about traveling back in time that they begin to lose any and all control. By the film's ending, there are so many timelines and different Abes and Aarons running around, they both metaphorically, but also literally, have no idea who each other really is. Despite the film's complexity, time travel is simply used as a story device to showcase the dissolution of Abe and Aaron's friendship, and everything that happens as a result of them meddling with time travel 
and the levels of complexity the plot reaches are all extrapolations of the film's initial simple sci-fi setup. Whereas Looper uses time travel to set up the story and then later introduces another completely different sci-fi concept so late in the game. It's also odd, considering TK isn't even necessary in order to tell the story. While it is insinuated that Sid's powerful TK powers are what allow him to take over the mob of the future, I don't really think him having said powers is all that essential. At the end of the film, it is revealed that old Joe killing Sarah results in Sid eventually becoming the Rainmaker, which is also quite a big plot hole, but I digress. But if Sid had a vendetta against the mob from such a young age, I feel like the audience could still buy him taking over the mob 30 years from now, even if he didn't have his powers. Come to think of it, if Sid was so OP as a child, why did it take him so long to take over the mob? He probably could have pulled said feet off by the time he hit middle school. However, my critique of introducing a secondary sci-fi concept in the film may not be one that is shared by many. Many have mentioned that, since it is in fact a sci-fi film, suspending their disbelief in terms of buying into TK wasn't that big of a deal. However, the true fatal flaw is not TK itself, but rather a symptom of its introduction. The film making TK into such a major plot element in the second half of the film results in our protagonist, Young Joe, becoming a dreaded, passive protagonist. I have spoken before on this channel about different kinds of protagonists, the main ones being active, reactive, and passive. Active protagonists are main characters that push the plot forward via their own individual actions. Take the man with no name in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The entire film is driven by his desire to find the Confederate gold stash. If Blondie decided to just stay home and catch up on Sister Sister, there would be no film. Antonio Salieri in Amadeus and Marlon in Finding Nemo are great examples of active protagonists. Next up is reactive protagonists. Reactive protagonists are often characters who don't necessarily drive the main action of the film, but their reactions to the actions of others progress the plot. Take, say, Harry Potter. While Harry more often than not just wants to be a regular wizard, and it is in fact Voldemort and his goth gang, that stirs up all the drama in his life, Harry is an extremely reactive character in that his character is defined by his reactions to the events that are as a result of the actions of the antagonist. John McClane of Die Hard and Katniss Everdeen of The Hunger Games are notable mainly reactive protagonists. Keep in mind mainly active protagonists are often very reactive and most mainly reactive protagonists do often make decisive actions that tremendously influence the development of the story. I would argue that there are some fundamental differences between the two archetypes, but in any case, as long as your protagonist is doing something to push the story forward, you are usually good to go. However, this brings us to the third type of protagonist, which is of course... Have you ever seen a movie where the main character doesn't really do anything? Where they just sort of sit around and act as almost a walking story device so the audience can bear witness to the far more interesting crap that is going on around them? Where we may be told a lot of stuff about a character and who they are and what they are like, but we don't actually see any of these qualities represented through their actions. That's a passive protagonist. That is not to say a passive protagonist cannot work in certain circumstances, but more often than not, a character is defined by, and the audience learns about a character through, their actions. And if a character doesn't do all that much, more often than not, it leads to the character becoming boring as balls. Now you may say, well, hold on, Young Joe is of course an active slash reactive protagonist. Once old Joe comes back from the future, Young Joe sets out to hunt him down and kill him, which is true, until we hit the midpoint of the film, which has young Joe arriving at Sarah's farm, where he basically just vegges out and doesn't do anything of note until the third act when old Joe rolls up a whopping 42 minutes after young Joe arrives at the farm, nearly 40% of the film's runtime. Now that is not to say what young Joe goes through in the second half of the film is not essential, as his relationship with Sarah and Sid leads to his decision to sacrifice himself in the film's finale, but unfortunately for the bulk of the second half of the film, young Joe is literally just sitting around and waiting for the plot to catch back up to him. I would argue the reason the film stays so long at the farm is because it needs to spend time developing Sid's TK powers and the reveal that he is in fact the Rainmaker. Again, all of this is necessary, 
and there's plenty going on, and the relationship between young Joe and Sarah and Sid is developed, but that doesn't change the fact that young Joe is literally just sitting around for two-thirds of an hour waiting for old Joe to re-enter the story. When the diner scene rolled up, I was excited to see young and old Joe face off throughout the second half of the film, with perhaps young Joe seeing the sort of person he would one day become if he continued on this path. But unfortunately, they were kept separate for the vast majority of the runtime following old Joe's introduction. So overall, as to how I would have rewritten this to make young Joe a bit more proactive, instead of young Joe chilling at the farm with Sarah and Sid, perhaps he goes on the run with them to a safe house of some sort. Perhaps young Joe leaves the farm for a bit to try and track down old Joe and prevent him from killing the other two kids on his hit list. Or, instead of having old Joe find out that Sid is the Rainmaker after Sid kills the Gatman, perhaps young Joe uses Sid as bait to set a trap for old Joe. After realizing that he was willing to put the life of a young boy in extreme danger to accomplish his goal of hunting his older self down, young Joe begins to realize what a selfish person he truly is, which in turn sets up his eventual self-sacrifice at the end of the film. Again, all the pieces are there, and that is not to say the second half of the film is a total wash, but I think the film overall would have been improved if it would have been able to keep up the tension and rising action that it maintains so well throughout the first half of the second act, as opposed to the film slowing down to a borderline crawl come the midway point. The film could have done this by way of making young Joe more proactive in hunting old Joe down, and through his attempt to do so, we as an audience are shown through his actions, the sort of selfish person that young Joe is, which in turn clashes with his growing connection to Sarah and Sid, and thus sets up his final decision in the finale to sacrifice himself to keep them safe. It would be interesting to see what the second half of the film would have looked like if TK was removed from the narrative altogether and Ryan Johnson was forced to make young Joe more proactive in hunting down old Joe, since all the setting up of TK doesn't take up such a large part of the second half of the film. By no means a massive narrative breaking flaw, but one I find notable nonetheless. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of One Fatal Flaw. Next episode, we will discuss Jordan Peele's 2017 satirical horror film, Get Out, a film that is a quintessential example of how sometimes, as a director, going with your initial instinct when it comes to the conclusion of your film is the correct way to go. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, consider supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.